जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राध माधव कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन वाल बाोपी जय गोपी जन वाल बासूर न चन रंग जिन्हा चंद रंग जिन्हा मुना चीर वान चारी या मुना चीर वान चारी Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare जय प्रभु पदा जय प्रभु पदा प्रभु पदा जय प्रभु पदा जय विष्णु पाद पर महान सब पर विजय का आचार्य आज तो थोड़ा सच फीशी मार His divine grace, A. C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Sri La Prabhu Padaki, is gone. Founder Acharya Sri La Prabhu Padaki Jai, Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Parvaja Kacharya. Astur Sat Sri Sri Madhus Divine Grace Sri La Bhakti Sadanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees, and all glories to Sri Sri. Guru and Goranga. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Reading from the Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter Eight, Text Number Forty Four. सुत उवाच पृथाए थम खुला फद परिन्नु था किलो दया मंदम जहां सा वायकुंतो मोहयानीव माया सुत उवाच पिताए थम खुला फई परिन्नु था किलो दया 
मंदम जहा सा वायकुंतो मोहयानिव माया सुताउ वाचा पिताये थम खाला पढ़ाई परिनु था किलो दया मंदम जहा सा वायकुंतो Mohayaniva Maya. Please chant. Vaishnavis, please. Go ahead, finish. Synonyms, word by word. Suta uvacha. Suta said. Pritaya. By prita. Kunti. Itham. This. Kalapandai. By chosen words. Parin, excuse me. Paranuta. Paranuta. Being worshipped. Akila, universal, Udaya, glories, Mandam, mildly, 
Jahasa smiled. Baikuntaha, the Lord, Mohayan, captivating, Iva, like Mayaya, his mystic power. Translation and purport by his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. Sutta Goswami said, The Lord, thus hearing the prayers of Kunti Devi, composed in choice words for his glorification, mildly smiled. That smile was as enchanting as his mystic power. Please repeat. Sutta Goswami said, The Lord, thus hearing the prayers of Kunti Devi, composed in choice words for his glorification, mildly smiled. That smile was as enchanting as his mystic power. Purport. Anything that is enchanting in the world is said to be a representation of the Lord. The conditioned souls who are engaged in trying to lord it over the material world are also enchanted by his mystic powers, but his devotees are enchanted in a different way. By the glories of the Lord, and his merciful blessings are upon them. His energy is displayed in different ways, as electrical energy works in manifold capacities. Srimati Kunti Devi has prayed to the Lord just to enunciate a fragment of his glories. All his devotees worship him in that way, by chosen words, and therefore the Lord is known as Uttama Shloka. The highest words, the best words. No amount of chosen words is sufficient to enumerate the Lord's glory, and yet he is satisfied by such prayers as the Father is satisfied even by the broken linguistic attempts of the growing child. We have little Abai here who gives us a very good example of exactly that. He's just learning to speak. So his work, words are broken and uh, not always clear, but adorable nonetheless. Uh, the word maya is used both in the sense of delusion. Did I skip anything? No, no okay, fine. The word maya is used both in the sense of delusion and mercy. Herein, the word maya is used in the sense of the Lord's mercy upon Kunti Devi. Omagina Timirandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance, and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisances unto his lotus feet. Again, thank you all very much for coming. It's a pl pleasure to share these wonderful teachings. So, um, so we're coming, we've just come to the end of Kunti's prayers, and uh, we could just meditate upon those for the rest of our lives, and, and that would be enough to get us back home, back to Godhead. It is so filled, so juicy, so replete with loving, submissive devotion to the Supreme Lord. And Krishna is enjoying her loving devotion. That's why he's smiling. Uh, he's smiling because he's feeling how true she is, how, how sweet she is, how loving she is, how appreciative she is, how grateful she is, how, she, how wonderful she is and how she is exalting his uh, amazing uh, powers and his amazing qualities. So it is not that Krishna is some gigantic egotist, uh, you know, who just loves to be glorified. No, he loves the purification 
that she gets from glorifying him. Just as we try to be selfless by giving, 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 similarly, Krishna cannot help but to give her blessings, to give her his grace, to give her his sweetness, his kindness for what she is expressing to him in a very true and faithful and loving way. So therefore he smiles. And it is such a, it's mentioned over and over again that his smile is so enchanting. It's so sweet. It's so penetrating. For those devotees who are sincere and trying to become even more sincere, trying to become more loving, trying to become more devoted, more submissive, more surrendered, when a devotee hears about that smile and visualizes it, he himself feels great joy within. So similarly, when Kunti would see that beautiful smile of the Lord, which is a smile of uh, appreciation, a smile of gratitude, a smile of affection, a smile of utter adoration, like a father uh, smiling on his uh, loving, sweet, kind, uh, appreciative daughter. And so he smiles that way. And what could Kunti feel except the bliss of Krishna's appreciation of what she feels is so little, so insignificant, so, so nothing. She feels that Krishna deserves mountains and mountains and mountains and of better and higher and greater praises. That's her, that's her feeling. How do we know that? Because she's already said it. She's expressed her appreciation for Krishna, when she and her five sons uh, were living in the forest for some time. And in that time, it is a very difficult situation because they were, it was a jungle. Uh, perhaps I can reiterate uh, a little bit of how that happens, how they got into the jungle in the first place. Um, going back some time, uh, Dhritarashtra um, formed a plan with his son Duryodhana that they, they would encourage the Pandavas to um, take a vacation. Uh, they had been fighting and, um, uh, and winning so many battles, amassing so much property, uh, establishing a higher and higher level of victory for the uh, Kauravas, Pandavas. Actually, Kauravas and Pandavas are the same. They're not two different uh, dynasties. Kaurava is the, comes from King Kuru. And so Pandu was from King Kuru and Dhritarashtra was from King Kuru and Vidura. They're all from King Kuru. But in order to differentiate the sons of Pandu from the sons of Dhritarashtra, the Dhritarashtras were called Kauravas or the Kurus. And Pandavu's sons were called the Pandavas. And those who would side with them or ally themselves with them were also called Pandavas. So we should not think that there are two different dynasties. It's one dynasty, the Kuru dynasty, and they're all basically Kauravas. But when you have a war, you have to be able to differentiate who's who and on what side he's on, what side he's on. So um, uh, anyway, the uh, important uh, point here is that um, is that Kunti Devi is, uh, has been, uh, uh, when, uh, this backtracking, uh, when uh, the, I, say, I was speaking about the vacation that uh, uh, Dhritarashtra wanted the Pandavas to take, uh, not for a vacation, but to kill them. That was the main idea. And the idea would be is that uh, they would, in the assembly, they would mention to the Pandavas, well, why don't you take a vacation? You've been working so hard, uh, amassing properties and, and getting, collecting taxes and doing all the things that administrators do. You really deserve a, a vacation. Not a month or two months, you take a whole year. Just rest, relax, shoot arrows, uh, go swimming, wrestle, just have a lot of fun and relax yourselves. So they thought about it and they thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. They really did need a vacation. So the idea, of course, was to get them out of the kingdom of uh, Hastinapur and put them uh, someplace else which would be distant. I think it was Ranavata, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
and a beautiful mansion would be built for them, which it was, and they would live in that mansion. And the idea was that at a certain point in time, when the Pandavas would least uh, suspect it, that uh, one of their uh, men would burn down the house with Kunti in it and the five Pandavas. And therefore, they would be out of the way and there would be no opportunity, no chance for Yudhishthir to become, as was his rightful position, the king. He couldn't become the king because if he was burned, if he was dead, there would be no Yudhishthir or Bhima or Arjun or uh, Nakula Sahadev. So that was the plan. Little did they know that Vidura, uh, as we know, is an incarnation of Yamaraj. And he had quite a number of mystic powers, although he hardly used them. But he could read minds by just looking at the face. So when this plan was hatched and he looked at them, he knew the plan. And so when the Pandavas and their mother were leaving, he said some very cryptic words in regard to be careful of fire, uh, make sure that you have an underground tunnel to escape from the fire. Of course, they were not exactly clear on what this was about because it was cryptic and it was also in a different language than they normally spoke. But they, they had some idea of it. <clears throat> Lo and behold, after the Pandavas left, um, a miner showed up at this Vranavata mansion. And the miner said, I've been sent by your uh, uncle Vidura and uh, he has given me some precise instructions to assist you. You know he talked to you when you were leaving uh, about <clears throat> a fire and a tunnel. Said, yes. She said, well, I am a miner and I know how to build tunnels. And if you didn't understand your uncle's message, the message was is that your cousins have arranged to burn you down to death. This house is made of combustible materials like shellac and things like that. So a little bit of fire which touches it, it will go up into a big blast of flames. So we need to protect you. Vidura, your uncle, wanted to protect you and make sure that you would have an excellent escape route, okay? So they, they welcomed that and they <clears throat> did it in such a way that there was a, uh, an agent of Duryodhana who was living in that house. He was supposed to be a protector. Actually, he was the one, Paranjana, who was going to light the fire. So, uh, you know, it seemed very innocent and very kind. Oh, Duryodhana is giving us a, a protector here. We don't have to think about at night anyone attacking us or marauders or animals or anything like that. So the miner would work at night and very quietly so that Puranjana, who was living at the front of the house, uh, he would not hear anything. Or if he heard anything, it would sound like the noise of the animals, you know, because it was a, a forest land area. So anyway, what happened was that the... Uh, the tunnel got built. It went from the house all the way to the Ganges underground, okay, to the beach of the Ganges. And um, uh, the, the, the miner told him that it, it was done. And the next thing is to find out when Duryodhana planned to burn the house down. That was the big question, so that they would escape promptly. So what happened was that... Uh, the Pontifus got a message uh, from Vidura through someone else that on a certain night, uh, which would be a, a dark night of the moon, if I remember, and uh, on that night, the house would be burned down and therefore you should take precaution now. So knowing this, what the Pontifus did, uh, acting as if they knew nothing about this, they made a big banquet the night before uh, the house was to be burned down, or actually, yeah. So there was a big banquet, and all many, many Brahmins, they were invited to this. And um, 
It was big, feasting, drinking, very revel, a lot of revelry, a lot of fun, a lot of play. No one could ever suspect that anything untoward or unfavorable was going to happen. Anyway, uh, what happened was that that was the, the night, you see, that... Uh, uh, no, the next night was the night that the, the fire was supposed to be lit. But the Pandavas, knowing that it was the next night, they felt that they would get ahead of the situation. So what they did is they had Bhima during the night, go out very quietly, very uh, gently. And he went to the room in which Puranjana was staying. And the first thing is he burned that room with Puranjana in it so that he could not escape. So Puranjana uh, was screaming and yelling. and this, uh, he, he wanted to burn six people and he's screaming and yelling as if you know, they've done such sinful act. The next thing that happened was that the Pandavas had this tunnel built, they had a staircase which led downstairs. So they went down into the tunnel and they went out and eventually they reached the Ganga. Now there was an interesting thing that happened during the, <clears throat> during the banquet. Six uh, kind of low class uh, people, uh, I forgot what they call them, uh, so, uh, Nishina, Nishida, yeah. So the six Nishida is a mother and she had five kids about the same age as the Pandavas. So they came in and uh, they, they asked for some food and Kunti says, yes, please sit here. She didn't put them with the Brahmins. She put them aside. She says, here, have all, as much as you like. Well, they love to drink. So they were drinking and drinking and they got so completely <clears throat> intoxicated that finally they decided to leave while everyone was still uh, sitting on the floors there. And so they went through a corridor and as they went through this corridor, uh, it they saw there were doors there, as there normally is in corridors. So they opened, pushed open one of the doors, and they saw it was a storage room. And they were so intoxicated, they, it was almost impossible for them to get to the front door, standing up in a straightforward uh, manner. So they went inside that uh, storage room, and they closed the door, lay down, and went to sleep. But nobody knew that, because all they saw is the six going out of the banquet hall. So they assumed that they, le they left. They went outside. That was what the assumption was. So then what happened, coming a little bit again forward, is that Bhima went out and first he set fire to the house, the front of the house, and then he set fire to the walls of the house, and then he also set fire to one of the rooms of the house in which the six were living, uh, were lying, sleeping, but he didn't know that. He had no knowledge of this because the door was locked and the assumption was, was there's a locked storage room. So uh, at that point, when the fire was lit, the Pandavas went downstairs, downstairs into the, uh, uh, into the cellar and then across to the Ganga. And then the house went up into flames. It was so, or it was such that the... Um, the mother and the sick five kids could not escape. It was impossible. There was smoke everywhere. You see these same types of things happen right here in Los Angeles. When the smoke envelops you, you can't breathe, and it doesn't take long before you become asphyxiated and you die. So um, that's what happened. So what happened is at the end of the night, and finally the flames went down, and then people came to see. They assumed that the Pandavas had gotten it. Nobody knew that there was a t tunnel. Uh, so, when they examined the area, there were the five bodies which were singed to such an extent that they were unrecognizable. You know, if you keep burning a body, all you see is basically charcoal. So that's what everyone thought, that the Pandavas were killed. And that uh, Kunti, there was also a mother there. They thought that Kunti was also dead. Could not, because all you saw is basically charred, uh, uh, charcoal and bones. So therefore, there was a big funeral ceremony in, in, back in, uh, in Hastinapur. Everyone was bemoaning and grieving the death of the Pandavas. Meanwhile, the Pandavas, when they had gotten to the Ganga that night, Vidura, again, Krishna working so wonderfully to make sure the Pandavas would stay alive. 
So Vidura had sent uh, a boatman. And the boatman came along the beach and he saw the Pandavas waiting there. Uh, they were going to be, keep walking. He said, I have a boat. Please come. I'll take you across. So he talk, took them across the Ganga and then he left them there. And then it was that area where Kunti and her five sons, they began wandering along the bank of the Ganga uh, several miles. And it was full of jungle, you know, snakes and tigers, lions and all that kind of stuff. But nobody was living there. Uh, no human beings anyway. So finally the Pandavas, they found a, a place where they could just, uh, where they can rest and uh, lie down. And uh, that's exactly uh, what happened. Uh, they lay down there. And uh, then a number of other things happened, which I won't go into because it's not germane to this particular uh, part of the story. The most important thing is they were in a very helpless, if not hopeless, position. The problem was is if Duryodhana knew where they were, and he was going to send spies everywhere just to make sure. Uh, if he knew where they were, well, he would just send a, a small <clears throat> army and just kill them. May not succeed, may, but the point is they were being, um, they were under attack, so to speak. They were under threat. So they stayed at that particular place, and some interesting... <clears throat> Odd things happen. There was a Rakshasi there, and uh, she was sent by her brother uh, to to kill the five the Pandavas and their mother. He said, "You kill them, and we'll have we'll have a nice dinner tonight." Rakshasas eat human beings. Okay, so he says, "You go down and 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 take care." But the Rakshasi, uh, she looked at Bhima, who was who was the watchman, to make sure that nobody would attack his mother and the brothers. So when she looked at him, she fell in love with him. <laughs> it didn't exactly help the plan of her, hus of her brother she was living with and up in a tree house. In any event, uh, she became so uh, enamored of Bhima, and it was a big talk, and he did end up marrying her, but he did tell her, I could never bring you back to Hastinapur, and there were reasons for that, because she was in a different category of being. She was a Rakshasi, and he was like a, a great kshatriya. So if anybody heard about that, there would be a lot of talk and it would not be respectable talk. And the Pandavas needed to maintain their, their reputation. So anyway, she helped them, though, to find another place. It was interesting. She could fly them on her back. She could fly. Okay? So she, they, they got on her back. She made herself. They also changed their shape and they changed their size. So they, she got on her back and she flew them well, who knows, 100 miles or so away, and then created a beautiful little house for them, and uh, she served them uh, very, very nicely, and then Bhima went on a, he went on a honeymoon with her, she took him up, flew him up to a high up in the mountains, and he had a good time up there, and then came back. So, but all in all, the important point is that Kunti continues to say in this prayers of Queen Kunti, that this calamity, this sense of hopelessness, this sense of helplessness, this sense of, 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 of insecurity, this sense of uh, not knowing what the next day would bring. Remember, there were snakes all around, lions, tigers, all this kind of thing. Although, yes, the Pandavas were uh, quite capable of taking care of themselves. But, you know, if you get six hungry roaring lions or tigers around who haven't eaten in a few days, it might not be so easy. Especially lions and tigers, they're very cagey. They, they, they fight in such a way as they, one attracts somebody on this side, and, the, and while everybody is going here, the other lions, they get in the back, and they attack from the back. So they're very, very shrewd. Very, yeah. So anyway, long story short, is that this is what they had to endure for approximately a year. Then they would travel. And, and uh, uh, so, excuse me, they lived in this little place for about a year, and then they moved to another area, which was where eventually uh, Vyasadev, he told them to go to a particular area, particular place, which is the same place where uh, Lord Nityananda, Ekachakra, he lived. So that's where they stayed for a while. And there's a lot of things to happen there as well. So they were constantly in a state of threat. 
who was going to, there was a big Rakshasa there. Rakshasa was going to kill the, uh, own, the owner of the house in which they were staying at Ekachakra. There was constant threat, constant insecurity, constant uncertainty, constant fear uh, of, in this situation. So this is what Kinti is talking about. She's saying over and over again, this calamity, yes, it frightened us so much that all I kept thinking about Krishna is you, you, and more of you. Remember, Kunti is the aunt of, of Krishna. And she has great affection and she also for him from a family point of view, but she also has great affection for him for what he is, namely, as she herself mentions, you're omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. You are free of the three modes of material nature. They don't affect you. You create this world. You maintain it. You destroy this world. You give pleasure and pain to all living entities. You satisfy the desires of living entities. You give spirituality to those who perform loving devotional service to you. So you do all this, and so you are so wonderful, kind, compassionate, loving, sweet, caring. These are her own uh, affectionate gr words of gratitude. And that's why he's, again, he's smiling. Because she is truly, deeply appreciative of who he is, what he is, and what he has done for them. And because she's not taking it for granted, because she's taking it as something that great souls think of themselves as very sinful, even though there are hardly any sinfulness. But like after the end of this war, Yudhishthira, he just goes around saying, in a mood of guilt, I killed all these people. I started this war. I'm responsible for, you'll see in the next few verses, I, 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 I caused so many warriors to be killed now there are so many widows there are so many children without fathers so many daughters and sons so many relatives have now split apart women will be alone there will be some of them will be tempted to yield to their carnal desires this is all my fault this is it's not his fault at all and krishna reassured him of that uh, in, in due course he says this is the fault of these, 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 uh, these rogues, these rascals, these uh, criminals, Duryodhana and camp, their fault. You never would have gone to war if it hadn't been for them not giving you back the property that you allowed them to have for a period of 13 years and they were supposed to return it to you and they never returned it to you. So you're a warrior and you could not just stand idly by. You had to act in a righteous way and set a proper example for other persons in the world that when you're a kshatriya, you just don't let your property be taken away and you just stand by idly. No, not kshatriyas. You fight to the last breath. So don't think that it's your fault. So you just, of course, became mollified uh, as a result of the uh, sweeter words, of course, which came from... Uh, Krishna eventually and so anyway we have in this uh, particular pastime so many uh, expressions so many examples of how Kunti uh, had to um, depend upon Krishna and she had five sons anyone who was here as a mother know that you're when you have five sons it's enough that you want even one to be protected, but you want all your sons to be protected. Please, Lord, if you want to take me, that's okay. I'm older. I, I've already lived. I don't need anything. But my sons, they can defend, they can protect, they can guard the world, they can make it a better place to live in. Please, oh Lord, protect my sons. They're so kind, so virtuous, so lovable, so caring, so sweet. I've raised them that way. And they had Bhishma Dev to help. And they had Vidura to help. They're spotless. They're wonderful. They're the kind of persons who should run and rule this world. So please, Krishna, protect my sons. So this is the kind of mood 
that she is constantly generating a mood of prayer, a mood of, of, of begging, a mood of petitioning, a mood of crying out. Like Prabhupada said, when we should um, chant the holy name, I saw there was in this book on chanting the holy name, crying out, you cry it out as if it's your last five minutes. That way, Krishna cannot fail to hear the pleading of our hearts. But sometimes devotees, they just want to get it over with fast. Sold American like a tobacco auction. That was a joke. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, it happens like that. Different kinds of chanting. Anything but this crying out with love, this crying out with desperation. It doesn't mean you have to be screaming out as I sometimes hear devotees in the temple which cause other devotees to leave the temple because they can't hear themselves chant. Japa means soft chanting. I'll repeat, soft, not loud so anyone else can hear it. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. If I didn't have the mic here, you could not hear me chanting. And that's wonderful because then everybody chants. Everyone can hear himself chant and doesn't have to hear him chanting, her chanting, him. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Japa is soft chanting. Kirtan is loud chanting. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Come on, give me a break, you know. So, uh, so that's it. And some devotees, they, they're not even cognizant of the fact and one, some wonderful devotees whom I know, they were, one was chanting, and chanting at, the, at a speed that I thought he was in an auto race. He was going like, no exaggeration. And some of you already know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I couldn't even make out the word. They were indistinguishable. Anyway, you get your job done fast. That's for sure. But I don't know what Krishna is listening to because who could understand it? <laughs> Even the Lord can't understand it. It's so uh, un unrecognizable. So yes, we chant with love in our heart. We chant in a mood of crying out, as the, as the book says, a mood of desperation. But that doesn't have to be a big external ostentatious display. It's in the heart. That's where it's to be felt. Sometimes I see devotees, they say, well, you should chant uh, crying out and, and chant in desperation. I've seen devotees, Hare Wait, but nobody can do any chanting. Hey, calm it, cool it. Yeah, but it says desperation. I said, okay, you want to do it that way? Go over by the railroad tracks. Nobody will bother you there. That way. So, so uh, therefore, we, the, when I was in school, there was a, we all got report cards, and the report cards had on the right-hand side your qualities, and on the left-hand side, it had your, uh, your, your grades for your English and uh, geography and uh, arithmetic and all that. So there was one little line which said, respect the rights of others, okay? That's what it's all about. Everyone has the right to hear himself chant, okay? So... Therefore, why should I violate the right of someone who is trying to hear himself or herself chant so she can or he can say it or express it in a loving, sweet, warm way to the Supreme Lord? Hmm? Isn't that? Why should I hinder him or her from doing that? And if I do it so loudly, he can't do that because he's just hearing me. Okay? So, therefore, Kunti is in a mood of desperation, a mood of dire uh, fear, uh, a, a mood in which she wants her, 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 her sons to be protected. She wants the whole world to be protected. This is Kunti Devi. This is our example. This is a woman whom we should try our best to uh, become like at least in the virtues and the qualities that she has so nicely, so lovingly, and so uh, so clearly exhibited. Queen Kunti Ki, yeah. Queen Kunti Ki, yeah. Queen Kunti Ki. Yeah. And for those of you who want to listen to it, I have done the narration. <laughs> you can get it on my one of my CDs, or uh, you can get it in uh, 
in, uh, uh, I can email it to you. So uh, if anyone wants to hear the whole book from cover to cover, they can get that. Uh, so I want to thank you all very much for uh, listening, giving me a hearing. Are there any questions, any confusions, any comments that anyone here would like to make so that I can improve my talks in the future? Yes, Prabhuji. Uh, oh, can we get the mic? Thank you. <laughs> Someone is running. So those of you on the internet, just hold it for about five seconds. It's on the way. Here it comes. It's halfway here. Three quarters. And Sachi Tanoi has got the mic. Please. Haribo Maharaj. How can you, what would you advise to a, a devotee to, let's say, for example, you hear someone who's been chanting for many years, but uh, is not pronouncing properly or is not even properly chanting the mantra, but is the most diff I notice that it's the most difficult where you try to advise someone because sometimes the ego comes. <laughs> yeah. The ego comes. What are you talking about? I'm chanting my rounds good. And I've seen that. What yes. would you advise? My advice uh -huh. is don't give him any advice. <laughs> you can't take advice yet. You have to give advice. As, as, as Jesus said, don't throw your pearls before swine. And Krishna also said, uh, don't, uh, we say every morning uh, that we should, uh, not, uh, uh, we should not try to enlighten the ignorance who are going to spit it back in your face. Uh, so that's the first thing. A person has to be receptive to make improvement. And now if a person has reached this point where they don't need to be improved because they've already reached it, you know, the position, the top, the summit. Uh, so the only thing is to leave that but uh, we have a temple president here, and what I generally do if I see somebody who's really out of line re repeatedly and consistently is I make an appointment and I say, we have a problem, and uh, I tell him, this is what is going on, and this person thinks that this is okay, and if I were to tell him, he would just say, hey, get out of my face, man. I'm chanting, and I'm doing it well, and Krishna loves me. That, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of answer you get. So I've gotten those answers too. So, so therefore, temple president makes an appointment and he sits him down and cools him down, gives him some maha prasadam, you know, sweetens him out, uh, softens him up. And uh, so the person is uh, already laughing and smiling. That's the first thing. You don't even say anything until he's laughing and smiling. Okay? Now you go in slowly, uh, in like a needle, as Prabhupada says, and out like a plow. So little by little, you start to touch on it. Excuse me, but can you please chant the Hare Krishna for me? So he starts to chant, and he does it right because it's just two in a room, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. No, no, the way you do it in the, in the temple. Well, I try to get it done. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Excuse me, but that's not the way Prabhupada advises us to do it. So I would think that you would like to, comp you would like to, uh, to follow uh, exactly what Prabhupada is asked to do. And I'm a Prabhupada disciple and I know because if you do it the way he says, then you're going to please Krishna. If you please Krishna and Krishna will give you his blessings, you're going to go straight to the summit, straight to the top of the mountain of devotional love. Would, don't you want that? So, yeah. so therefore, what are we, how are we going to chant the next time that you're in the, So I'm giving you a little example. All right? I'm making it up as I go along. I've had many problems, questions like that. But the most important thing is don't even start criticizing unless the person feels like he's on top of the world. Big egos need to be fed. And when you feed them and they're, it's like a big person who has a big stomach and likes to eat twice as, three times as much as everybody else, you got to give him a big meal. And then you can criticize him as much as you want because he's half asleep then anyway. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's basically... Uh, the way we try to handle it. Uh, that's not the only way. There are other ways. Each devotee has to take shelter and take guidance and inspiration from Krishna himself. What I often do is I pray to the Lord, please help me, tell me what I have to say. To, and if I can't say anything, would you who are in the heart of this particular devotee, would you tell him uh, 
after, as we, we know the verse, to those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, I give them the understanding by which they may come to me, to show them special mercy I, dwelling in their hearts, destroy with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness born of ignorance. So, Lord, you're in the heart. Would you please give them a little enlightenment, help them to understand that he's not making much progress, and all he's doing is getting his rounds done quick so that he can maybe go out and do his books or go and cook for the deities or whatever he's going to do. Please help him. Because if I say it, and I don't have very many diplomatic skills, he'll just get upset and might even leave, go to another temple. So many possibilities are there. So, therefore, pray to Krishna. He'll give you the guidance, you, whether you can deal with it directly or you can deal with it See, he takes stage center. I, I've lost my uh, performance. The little Abai, it, you can see how attractive, how adorable, how lovable he is. Now, he's okay. In fact, if he wants, he can sit right here on the Vyasa sign. We can get a few nice sage remarks from him. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Uh, does that answer your question, Prabhu? Is there any other question that one may have here? Yeah, you sure? Uh, hello. Somebody said something? No? Yeah? I heard of sounds coming from some place. I don't know if it came from other... No? Thank you all. May Krishna bless you all unlimitedly. Hare Krishna. Glories to Srila Prabhupada.